Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Higher Education Tableau User Group Meeting for December of 2023. We're glad you could join us, and if you're like David, you might just be finishing out your year with us before you go on winter break. We've got a packed agenda today, so I will get right to it. <laughs> so we're going to have our Meet a Community member with Samantha Homier, and she's from San Bernardino Valley College. Next, we'll have tips and tricks with uh, the data management add-on with Lauren Hartman from University of Alaska and David Liska from SMU, followed by our traditional holiday Mad Libs that I'm going to uh, showcase and use that to teach you how to do dynamic zone visibility. Finishing up with the Tableau Doctor and our typical wrap-up and chat in our breakout rooms. So before we start, does anyone have any announcements? If you have any jobs that you want to share, um, you can come off mute and share them here. You can put them in the chat or you can share them in our Slack channel that Roshni just shared the link for. No announcements? All right, then we will just jump right in. All right, so Sam. Uh, comes to us from San Bernardino Valley College. She's a research analyst in the Office of Re uh, Research Planning and Institutional Effectiveness. She is also an adjunct faculty in mathematics and statistics, and she has spearheaded a campus-wide transition from static data presentation to dynamic, automatically updated dashboards. Bravo, round of applause. Uh, she is a co-lead for the new California Community Colleges Tableau User Group, which aims to support the state's community colleges with all their data needs. And the group is open to all Tableau users and is dedicated to enhancing understanding and creating and employing dashboards in the community college setting. So, Samantha, uh, start by telling us a little bit about yourself and describe your role and your team. Hi, everybody. So, yeah, I am a research analyst at a community college in Southern California. Um, and so mainly what we do is we analyze student data like the rest of you, right? <laughs> it's not much different. Um, we don't typically deal with um, anything other than like student and course data, right? So we don't deal with any budgets or anything like that. Um, and our office is... It just grew by quite a bit, actually. So before I joined, it was one senior research analyst for a college with around 17,000 students. Um, and so she was swamped. <laughs> and so we recently hired, um, I started last April. And then after that, we hired two more research analysts. So now we're a team of three research analysts, a senior analyst, and a dean. And so that's kind of how our college is working right now. Yeah. I didn't realize you hadn't been there for very long. Yes, yeah, I'm still relatively new in the sense, yeah. <laughs> um, so you already touched on this, but you can go into a little bit more detail. What kind of data do you work with mainly? Yeah, so mainly student and course data. Um, and so the main thing that I deal with specifically would be our student equity data, right? Because in California, we're all re required to keep a student equity plan. And, and track our data surrounding that. And so that's my one of my main responsibilities. Um, but then because I was the one that kind of built all the dashboards, it was kind of like whatever student data is relevant, right? So any kind of student data I've worked with um, or at least built a dashboard for, right? Um, and so it's that's probably the majority of the data that I work with, yeah. And how do you use Tableau at work? So we have a variety of public dashboards, which just are for any faculty member on campus or anybody within the community that want to look at the progress of our students. And then we also have quite a few private dashboards that only like department chairs have access to and things like that. Um, so we we're really using Tableau to try and become more of a data informed college. Cause right, like you said in my intro, we were using a lot of static data before. And so it was really hard to kind of keep up with all of the changes, like the day-to-day -day changes and things like that. And so we're really just trying to use a lot more dynamic data in as, um, as a whole, just to 
make any data informed decisions that we need to. Yeah. Well, that's oh, thank you, Rashi. All right. So, what is the favorite Tableau project that you've worked on? So there's actually two, I would say, and then neither of them are public, so I can't show any of them. But one is one that I built very recently for students that have um, dropped out. And the reason I like it is because in order for it to automatically update right with Tableau server, we have to do everything within Tableau, like all the calculations, and everything you can't really clean the data outside of it. And so um, I built this dashboard for students that stopped out, dropped out, or maybe dropped a course but stayed at the college, right? And so all of those calculations for calculating, have they stopped out? Have they stopped out from a prior semester, right? Like the trends of students that stopped out. And so all of those calculations were really fun to think about and put together. So that's probably one of my favorite ones. Um, the other one, I'm still working on it, but it's a map dashboard and it's my first dashboard with a map. And so I'm really excited to kind of delve into that and see how that's gonna work out, yeah. That is awesome. I'm really sad you can't share either of those, but. I know it's just the the drop one. It's too sensitive of data. The map one's just not ready yet. It's very ugly right now. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. So what is your favorite Tableau feature? Um, so I was going back and forth with this, but I think it would have to be the Viz and Tooltip feature because that really like and, and that was I incorporated that within the drop dashboard to kind of show this is how many students have dropped out versus this is how many students are enrolled currently, right? And so I was really only able to do that with the vision tooltip, or that's the only way I could think of how to do it um, to kind of bring in that different pieces of information. And so that was like, it's a really innovative way to bring in more in information. So uh, the vision tooltip. I agree. Um, how long have you been using Tableau and how did you learn how to use it? So I was kind of thrown in at the deep end last April when I, as soon as I started, I was told we need all of these dashboards. And there was about the six ones on that website were the top priority. And then there were some more that were top priority, but private. And so it was a lot of trial and error at first and a lot of just dragging things around and breaking things and learning how to fix them. Um, eventually we did get a Tableau training pass. So I went through all of those live courses, I think in like October and November of last year. Yeah. And then that e-learning website, I, I will say that one is very helpful for learning Tableau, the one that Tableau publishes themselves. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've been really wanting to get onto that e-learning site myself. So yeah, I just convinced yeah. our Dean to, to get it. Sorry. <laughs> oh no, that's great. Um, is there something you'd like to learn more about? So we just got, I think it's called data prep management, where you can use Tableau prep to automatically run flows, to automatically update your dashboards. And so I've been using Tableau prep, but not with the automatic updates. And so I need to learn how to adjust my flows to work with that. So that's where I'm at right now. Yeah. I need and then also that. just in general, like making them look really nice, right? Because some of the ones on Tableau Public look phenomenal. <laughs> and so just getting to that really, really good design stage is, is something I'd really like to learn, yeah. Yeah, I struggle with that. All right, so what is one thing you wish you could go back in time, I guess not very long ago, and tell Tableau newbie you? I was saying, so in some ways, I'm consider myself a Tableau newbie. So, but I would think just, and, and it's hard because I didn't really have time to slow down, but if I could just slow down, learn the back end of Tableau a little bit more, right? Cause it took me probably an embarrassing long time to learn the order of operations. So when I started learning like fixed, include, exclude, I didn't understand why it wasn't working sometimes. And so that was like, and I remember spending like a week on that, just like what is happening here, right? And it took me a very long time, yeah. And then just maybe like not spending that much time learning something, having better resources to learn Tableau at the beginning. Yeah. Yeah, I still struggle with the order of operations, so don't feel bad. I still have to look at this chart that Rossi just put so often. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> yeah. So do you ever use Tableau outside of work? And if so, how? 
I don't I want to start so like the data plus movies that was I I wanted to kind of like have that be my first project but it was taking me so I had a dashboard that I in progress but it was taking me a way too long to do it um so I kind of gave up on that but I'd really like to start because some of the ones that aren't related to like industry or the, the, the more personal ones are really interesting to look at and so I eventually I do want to get started in that area yeah that's fantastic so is there anything else you'd like to share before we go into the lightning round? I don't think so. Just thank you for having me today. Yeah. Oh, thank you. We're always Wait, excited. I, to I have a quick question. When mm -hmm. is the next uh, CCC tag? It's going to be February 14th. So Valentine's Day. And I know Lisa's going to love this. We have lots of love in the air. So we're doing an, a specifically level of detail um, uh, meeting. Yeah. I know my schedule is going to be fixed that day. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the puns. <laughs> All right. Well, we will jump into our lightning round. You know how this works. We ask you a question. You answer as fast as you can. So uh, December 19th, today is National Hard Candy Day. What is your favorite seasonal candy? I know this is not very popular, but what are they called? Candy corn at Halloween. I love those. <laughs> candy corn. I love those too. There's, you're right. It probably is an unpopular answer, but. Most people don't seem to like them. <laughs> I think they're delicious. <laughs> And it seems like we're not the only ones. Next up, uh, yesterday was answer the telephone like Buddy the Elf Day. So what is your favorite holiday movie? Mm, does it have to be Christmas related? Because all, <laughs> all of my holiday stuff is like Halloween. So it's probably like Beetlejuice. Yeah. Yeah, we didn't specify Christmas. We said holiday. <laughs> Then yeah, definitely. Beetle Beetlejuice. Juice. You know, I just saw that for the first time last year. <laughs> it's such a good movie. It was. Mm. Nightmare Before Christmas is good too. Mm -hmm. So December 17th was National Maple Syrup Day in Canada. Uh, what is your favorite thing to put maple syrup on? Waffles. Belgian waffles for sure. Yes. With like fruit on top. Oh yeah. Uh-huh. I love real maple syrup. All right, so tomorrow is games day. What is your favorite game to play? It's actually Monopoly Deal, which is like a very fast version of Monopoly. That's a card game. You could play like in 15 minutes. It's so much fun. It's oh, an man, amazing game. We have like four packs of Monopoly Deal so that we could take it when we go to places. And yeah, yeah, it's a great game. <laughs> I'm going to have to look that up because we're always looking for fun new games to play at our family get togethers. It's so quick too. Yeah, it's fun. All right. Next up on December 21st, it is the winter solstice. What is your favorite season? It have to be fall when like the colors on the trees are changing and the leaves are falling. Yeah, and there's not too much snow. <laughs> That is the right answer. <laughs> now that just happens to be my personal favorite too. Do you get a lot of snow where you live? Yeah, I live up in the San Bernardino Mountains. I live in a town called Crestline. And so we don't get that much snow throughout the year, but we actually got like 12 feet back in February. Like we were snowed in for about three weeks. Yeah. That is crazy. So we're hoping it doesn't happen again. No. I hope so. For your sake. I'm not yes. a snow fan. I no. All right. So December 22nd is Mathematics Day. And since you're a math instructor, who is your favorite mathematician? I'm going to say one of my old professors, to be honest. Oh, <laughs> because they, yeah. So she was really instrumental in getting me to where I'm at today. And what she taught me more when, or about like half of the classes I took when I was an undergrad. Um, and so we definitely one of my math professors from Cal Poly. Yeah. 
I, I bet she would be flattered to hear you say that. <laughs> Probably, yeah. <laughs> so just a little bit of background. Uh, Laura Urchioli, who used to, um, or she was one of our past media community members, uh, she, her math teacher from high school actually saw her on our tug and reached out to her. So math teachers, watch our tugs. <laughs> <laughs> that is so awesome. I had no idea. That is really cool here. Yeah. All right. Um, there are a lot of cookie days happening this week. Like December 18th was National Bake Cookies Day. December 22nd is National Cookie Exchange Day. And December 23rd is National Pfeffernoose Day. So what is your favorite cookie? Meal cookies for sure. Yeah. Oh. Mm. Which, Which is, is also not very popular. Without. <laughs> without. With or without nuts without okay you just like it straight just up plain. Cookies. <laughs> all right and to wrap us up uh december 23rd is national forest day so if a tree falls in the forest and there's no one there to hear it does it make a noise of course <laughs> <laughs> i I would have to agree with you because there's always somebody there to hear it. It's an animal. It's an insect. I mean, there's always exactly. going to hear it. Something that you can't see, maybe. Something mm -hmm. and then creepy. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for being our Meta community member this month and rounding out our year. And if you'd like to be a Meta community member in 2024, reach out and let one of us know because we'd love to have you. Thank you so much. This was very fun. All right. And I'll turn it over to uh, whomever is introducing our next speakers. And in true good planner fashion, we didn't actually figure out who was presenting up next. So um, I'll, I'll go ahead and do the intros. Uh, so we've got two folks um, from across from the, the two biggest states in the country um, and on opposite ends in terms of uh, longitude uh, presenting today on data management. See, because we were talking about maps earlier, I, I thought I'd bring some mappy things into the conversation. Um, so Lauren Hartman uh, is the lead reports developer at the University of Alaska Foundation. Uh, she manages the foundation's reporting platform and that, uh, that supports private fundraising for all of the campuses across the University of Alaska system. Um, and David Lishka from Southern Methodist University in Dallas or SMU uh, has been contracting as a visualization architect in SMU's Office of Information Technology since 2021. And prior to that, his work in, uh, his data work in other industries includes more higher education, heavy machinery manufacturing, healthcare and communications. Um, and they're here together to talk about the data management add-on in Tableau, which has uh, a whole bunch of functionality from being able to schedule Tableau prep flows to being able to actually dig into your data catalog and manage some of that metadata and some of the and track lineage and things like that. So without further ado, you guys take it away. All right. Thank you very much, Roshni. So um, in a nutshell, we wanted first and foremost to just relate that this is um, a, kind of the some of our experiences. Um, is everybody still seeing me? Yes. Yes. OK, I just got a message saying Zoom quit unexpectedly, which was a little distressing. Um, so yeah. Um, I was, I was warning Lauren about that during one of our rehearsal uh, sessions that I'd had that experience before. Uh, but to, to return to the subject, um, so this is going to be based on our experiences. Uh, we're hearing about Oh no. Now you're frozen. Now we lost them. Lost you, David. I think you might be back, but you're muted. Oh. All right. Now I can hear Hope you. Hope that uh, round two works a little bit smoother. 
Okay. Um, so we were discussing that um, during some of our usage of data management add-ons uh, features that uh, some of the some of the benefits are a little bit nebulous and that we find that uh, in some cases we're not sure what is actually part of data management. There might be a couple features that we're missing that we utilize, but um, are integrated in a fairly well-designed way that it, it's not always clear that it was something um, that only came along with uh, the data management add-on. In other cases, um, uh, we've been using it for a few years and uh, it, it blends in pretty pretty seamlessly. But uh, uh, we do have um, kind of uh, basically a grouping of three major categories. I, I've seen a couple presentations where there are uh, a couple of different ones or they have different names for them, but the ones that we were able to most cleanly define were prep conductor, uh, data catalog, uh, kind of grouped with lineage and virtual connections, uh, which also includes data policies. Um, one of the earlier things we wanted to share uh, was what interested our institutions in uh, purchasing uh, or obtaining the data management add-on. And in uh, SMU's case, um, it was largely initially driven by the lineage component, being able to see which, compo which database elements and which systems were um, most in demand and, and which had the most mission critical uh, implementation. Uh, but over time, that's actually changed. We're now, um, we, we were coming up for renewal of our, our subscription um, in August, right? And it actually switched over and Prep Conductor was now a little bit one of the more uh, decisive um, reasons that we were keeping it. So Lauren, did you want to share uh, your institution's situation? Yeah, so um, University of Alaska Foundation um, is, it's not, we don't have a system-wide implementation of Tableau at the University of Alaska yet. <laughs> So um, we actually use Tableau Cloud, which is another um, good reason that we were matched up because we can show kind of, there's a couple differences between cloud and server for other people that might have cloud. But um, the main reason that we purchased it is because of Prep Conductor. We had started using Prep um, more with our data preparation and um, wanted to have that feature to be able to automatically refresh the data um, so that's the main reason we got it. We were we were also discussing or embarking on um, a data catalog or data dictionary project. And since that was already a feature, we thought maybe we could utilize those features as well. Um, we haven't really started doing that yet. We're still kind of looking into that, but I can talk more about that um, when we get to that aspect. All right, let's um, move along. So one of the um, first elements, we'll start with um, conduct, prep conductor and um, some of the, one of the facets that it offers is the ability to both author and edit uh, prep flows. So you can, without having uh, prep builder installed on a local machine, you can start from scratch and construct the flow. This is a screenshot of editing, uh, but I have also gone through um, just for giggles and created a flow just within the, the realm of um, our Tableau server instance. So that was uh, something that was the ability to edit it is to me is much more valuable than authoring it straight up. But it, in both cases, it comes in kind of handy from time to time. I think um, if I were to be traveling or um, if there's an issue with my laptop and I'm not able to access prep builder, then having that functionality into our server environment is very helpful. All right. So, uh, Yes. Yeah, so, one of the next elements is scheduling, Lauren. Uh, so we have two slides. One, this first one is server, and then the next one is cloud. I think this might be the only difference between server and cloud as far as data management goes. 
is um, with server, you can set custom schedules and with cloud, you can't. Um, it has a schedule for one every hour and then it has these other monthly and, and week, weekly ones set up. But um, that hasn't been a huge issue for us. Um, so with this being the main reason we purchased it, we've been really happy with that feature. It's easy to use and we've never had any issues with it. Um, and I think that's all I have to say about that. Did you yeah. Yeah. And that is, so you're seeing, um, much less tidy than Lauren's screenshot from her cloud environment. You're seeing all sorts of, of, um, messy titles and names. So these instances, these uh, examples are uh, different ones that we've set up where uh, four times daily, weekdays, weekends, end of the month, uh, Monday mornings, a lot of different times. And this is just scheduling flows. Um, so as Lauren mentioned, this uh, prep conductor uh, is one of the narrow areas where there is a little bit of a difference between uh, experiences and server and cloud. Uh, server has the capacity, if somebody really wanted to irk one of our admins, um, you can set up a um, refresh interval as tight as 15 minutes. Uh, the resources, I mean, a lot of the time that it takes to execute the flows, do the querying, publish, is not going to take much less than that. I mean, you're looking at five to 10 minutes for a lot of ours. So that would be very interesting to see how, how that would work. It would just be wrapping up and five minutes later, we'd start seeing more activity as it started over again. Uh, so I think that that's, yeah, that's it there. Um, so they do talk about tasks. Um, for ones that are scheduled at the same time, each of these tasks, uh, there is prioritization so that you can set them up and um, one can um, uh, begin on its own uh, prior to the others if if there's um, an urgency for something and it always must be done at the same time. Otherwise, um, the uh, environment has ways to, to try to work out which ones um, it goes through. Uh, so link tasks is another feature related to um, prep conductor and is especially valuable with um, scheduling. So um, in a nutshell, it basically takes two distinct processes, whether it's a flow or whether it is an extract refresh or a subscription delivery. So those are all considered um, basically tasks and it can um, do multiples of those in a sequence following one of your predetermined um, flow um, schedule um, task schedules uh, task schedules I don't know if I mentioned is something that is able to be created by the server administrator only, uh, at least for in the server instance. It, cited admins do not have the ability to make uh, those types of edits. Did you have anything to discuss? No, regarding? just that we do not actually currently use linked tests, but I um, we have a couple of use cases where this would be really useful. So we probably will in the future. Cool. Data alerts are uh, another feature, and this was one, honestly, um, I didn't even realize that this was associated with um, with the data management add-on. So it basically monitoring um, dashboard content, uh, it'll, when certain events happen regarding that, so you basically pick a measure when it reaches, um, it meets a certain criteria, such as a threshold, it'll trigger and send um, a message to as many people as you specify. Um, I, I have one example here uh, in, in case where we have a large series of events happening um, to populate one of our data warehouses, uh, at least a portion of our data warehouse. So something is fed in from uh, several other uh, processes that are generally automatic, but 
uh, we have experienced problems where the vendor had some issues on their end and it was passing through empty data sets. So it would send a, um, it would trigger a flat file transfer and it would be loaded in, but it would not add anything. It would overwrite and cause uh, zero instances of something. Uh, by putting a dashboard together that looked at that and basically uh, kind of summarized the information, uh, I send that to myself and one of our database admins, and he's able, well, we're both able to know right off the bat that that's going to be a problem and needs to be uh, recovered from a previous load, and the um, vendor needs to be um we need to work with them for resolution. So that's a kind of a popular uh, solution for data alerts. I don't think you were saying, Lauren, that you use this too much yet. Okay. Um, no, but I really like your examples that you have here. You might steal some of them. One thing that Lauren does use much, much more than we do, uh, it starts getting into these uh, the data catalog feature. So within that that area of the data management add-on, uh, data labels are, are one of the, the features. And we don't use that as much here, but Lauren can share a whole lot about that. Yeah, and the expanded data labels is almost brand new, I think, in the last couple of months. Um, they, it previously had certified and two other data quality warning labels, but they've recently expanded it to include all of the ones that are shown here. And I think there's, I think the certified one is the only one that is included even if you don't have the data management add-on. Um, and the other ones work basically the same way. Um, it's really useful for, especially just reminding myself of which data sources um, have certain issues or warning your end users because um, if you add a warning and set it at high visibility, it shows up absolutely everywhere. It shows up in desktop every time you open the workbook. It, it has a little message in any published workbooks that are using that data source. Um, it's in the data details side pane um, in the published workbook. So there's no way you can miss it if you want to make sure that people know um, something about the data source. So that's really nice. And then the next slide has an example, but I realized, like I just said <laughs> before this presentation, that I picked a really bad example because certified is the only one that you have, even if you don't have the add-on, but the other labels look basically the same in this list, um, except they would show up in that second column, kind of hard to see, but there's a little icon with a warning. So they would show up as a symbol in that column if there was a warning on one of them, and then you can add a little description and everything. So, um, Yeah, we found those pretty useful for, for organization and um, an easy way to, to notify people if there's an issue. Yeah, we don't use that a whole lot. Um, I think one of the challenges for adoption with us it was uh, consistent usage of it that we were seeing um, where um, that was something that um, when we roll it out, we want to make sure everybody's on the same page and that using something is going to meet certain criteria before somebody makes the decisions to do this. So these data quality warnings, uh, for instance, uh, they can be applied to columns, data sources, databases, flows, and then uh, entire uh, virtual connections or just uh, tables within virtual connections, a virtual table. So a lot of um, kind of a lot of benefits there. Um, a lot of kind of great uses, but we wanted to make sure that everybody is, that we're not rolling it out saying under maintenance when somebody else is, is not using that and nobody knows if they should believe it or if it's um, a reliable use. So lineage is another um, 
is a very heavily, I mentioned that that's one of the, the driving forces for our initial adoption of data management. Why yeah, Lenny, wanna... I'm glad you mentioned the part about data labels. You can use them on different um, levels, I guess is how I would describe it. Um, and lineage is really fantastic. It wasn't the main reason we got it, um, but it's been something that we use a lot as well. And it's just really nice to be able to, this pane on the right is just amazing to be able to get better visibility into how everything is interacting and um, actually seeing the tables that make up um, your data sources, your published data sources. One thing though, that if I were to submit an idea and maybe I should for tables is to not just list the tables that make up a data source, but also show the joins. Um, that would be a much easier, simpler way to see how things are joined than having to go into the data source. But otherwise I've been pretty happy with it. And um, you can also connect directly to the tables in a published data source. Um, we haven't been able to do that just because of the nature of our, some of our published data sources, but um, depending on what you're using, that could be really useful as well. Thanks. And so um, the lineage is being displayed on the, the right-hand side where you can kind of see, uh, as Lauren was describing, just how the uh, similar to how the data quality warnings can be applied we're able to track kind of hierarchical arrangements of data. So right now we're looking at tables. Um, we can see above it data source, uh, databases and below it data sources. So uh, it's kind of the intersection of where those connect. Um, in this particular one, I'm, um, let me switch my cursor again, user pointer. So right um, here, so this is the kind of the level of detail that's selected. This is um, an embedded uh, data source, um, a, a workbook, um, the data sources that are embedded within a workbook and what those contain, uh, sheets, 29, 11 dashboards. So a little bit of um, activity going on, but that's kind of how it's everything's being arranged. One thing that we found was very helpful about this feature, um, and even though we aren't as excited about the interface, my um, manager who was originally responsible for purchasing this related that there's a lot of navigation and um, it's a little bit, it doesn't quite get everything to for distribution. It it doesn't. It's not clean. And as far as bringing something and um, showing it to everybody who's out there, um, but it does um, it does highlight some things. And if you have a specific question, then you're able to uh, make it work. And that was what was happening for us one in one instance where we had. Um, requests for some um, database revisions and being able to determine which tables that we were using um, and which ones we needed to keep, which had dependent um, worksheets. Uh, that was kind of a driving factor in which some of them could go uh, and other ones would have to be replaced and we'd have to contact people to, to make that work. Um, slightly different, um, basically a similar arrangement, but a different scope is um, looking at the even the field level. This is a screenshot that Lauren provided. Yeah, very similar to what David was just describing. The field's level of detail is also incredibly useful for if you need to make changes to a calculated field or um, a base field or something like that, um, you can see everything that would be affected by it, which I think we would have no idea how to do that before um, before we had this without doing a lot of manual work. So that's incredibly useful. Um, okay. And I think the next one shows um, more of the catalog type features that we were hopeful of using. 
Um, so this shows kind of two different levels of details. So the, the one on the left is what they call field details. So if you're going into a field in a published data source, this is what it looks like. And on the right, it's kind of a level up. It's from the table um, within that data source. So this will travel down to any published data source that's using that table. Um, and one thing that um, I've noticed is if you put a description in the table, um, it doesn't show up in the description on the left here, but it does show up. It shows up everywhere you'd expect. Like if you're in desktop and you hover over the field, it shows up like normal, but you can add a description at this lower level and it will override the one above it. Um, so that's a little bit of a nuanced customization option, depending on what you need. Um, the big drawback to all of these features is there's no easy way to mass import and export and update these, which is, which is probably the reason why we haven't actually implemented it yet. Um, you have to go into every field one by one and change them, which is really manual. Um, so I think that we probably won't use these features unless we get more into using the metadata API and being able to um, automate things more. But um, it is really neat, just like you can see there's links here that take you to the upper or lower level for the fields and see how things are connected. So um, still useful, but just not quite as useful as we were hoping it would really be great if they had more um, user-friendly import export, things like that. Yeah, there is something that uh, we have not utilized. We saw some evidence, but it's very vaguely referenced um, that talking about there is some REST API functionality that allows you to do some um, bulk um, modifications with the, the descriptions and things like that. But um, there wasn't very clear documentation that we could see either. So I'm not sure what uh, if that's something that they're working on or if it's um, what the exact status of. If somebody was really critical and uh, a hardcore lover of REST API calls, then that might be something um, they could look into. They're, so they're, it's not necessarily a dead end, but we weren't able uh, to find. And it certainly, to Lauren's point, it's that's not what I'd classify as an easy solution uh, when you have to start getting into that type of arrangement and compared to using some menu options or uploading a, a CSV or something. So, so ownership. Uh, so this is another really cool feature and we've used this a couple times. There was, um, the example I was talking about not to uh, a couple slides back uh, where we were talking about uh, deprecated tables and owners, um, people who had workbooks that depended on those. Uh, you are able to set this up that you can identify who the owners are for um, items that are related. So follow this lineage from this database to this table to this um, workbook, lenses, um, everything going or project rather everything starting from the top and moving its way down you can see um, who the owners are um, over on the the left pane there so that's it's a really kind of a nice feature um, you can see what their total count is so if you wanted to shift the focus and see oh, okay this is what we've got um, if you're looking at managing ownership to try to distribute it more evenly that could be another possible uh, function. Um, but in our case, that was not the, the main drive. It was to identify in a couple cases, okay, do you really need to use this table? And then you can send messages from directly within Tableau Server. Um, multiple recipients um, up to, I think it's around 75 characters or so uh, for the subject. And close to 4,000 for the body of the message. And uh, that's kind of a nice feature. I don't know if anybody else has used that a whole lot. 
ready to move on. Yeah, uh, I was just going to say we we don't don't use a lot mostly because um, it's only usually me or one other person that are the only two people that are the owners of the workbook. So, but yeah, it's a really useful feature if you have yeah. um, more people working on stuff. That's the benefit of having a small, efficient office is that you don't need extra features to when you can shout over the cubicle or into the next room to yeah. let somebody know something's going on. Or, uh, yeah, we some of the technology required to support our infrastructure sometimes is uh, like, what have we done to ourselves? <laughs> uh, so here's another um, kind of element uh, pertaining to lineage, the data details pane. Um, yeah, this is, I probably should have shown it in context because it looks a little weird out of context, but this shows up on the right side of a published workbook. Um, there's a button in the toolbar at the top that you push to open this on the right. And it has a little graph showing the views, which is kind of neat. Um, this is also where um, those data quality warnings uh, would show up. In addition to a pop-up, There's it also shows up here and has more information about the data quality warnings if you have those set. And then it lists all the fields that are in use in the workbook. And then if you um, click one of those arrows, it will show the description if you've added a description. Um, so in theory, if we were to be able to implement some more automatic way of adding and updating all of these field descriptions, um, that would be really neat for users of the workbook to be able to go in and see those here. Um, but for right now, it's not incredibly useful, but it could be useful um, in the future. It could be more useful in the future. Okay. Uh, virtual connections is something we've dabbled with a little bit. Uh, when I say we, I mean one of our other um, server admins. I have not messed with this myself. Um, I've worked at, with it from the end user perspective, but have not created uh, the virtual connections. And uh, some of the things have been pretty good. We've had some some good tryouts with it. Um, so virtual connections act like a, a buffer between one or more databases uh, and your Tableau environment in a nutshell. That's, uh, I think, pretty much. Now, again, this is kind of referring back to my first disclaimer. Uh, based on our experience, there might be some uh, different ways that these are utilized in co incorporating um, mixes of uh, uh, live connection databases and uh, hyper extracts or something. I'm not familiar with that aspect of it. Um, but what it does, um, the virtual connections do provide a, a table level style arrangement um, by putting themselves between the database and your Tableau environment. You can do a lot of um, cleaning particular to Tableau right from the start before any of the developer uh, level individuals get to uh, mess around with it. Um, it also saves a lot of headaches for the database administrators where you don't have to create uh, separate uh, credentials in order for somebody to access it. Everything stops at the virtual connection. So that it can be managed by um, individuals within your, your, your site admin or your server admin as far as limiting the uh, the accessibility to or the, the permissions uh, to those resources at that level. Um, one of the really high, heavily highlighted features is uh, row level security. Um, you use basically a policy table that has the resources that you want and then it has the uh, credentials that manage those are not necessarily credentials, but um, kind of a, a, a membership type of uh, field that would qualify, um, that would indicate which people are going to have access to that. Um, I'm trying to think of some of the other benefits. You can put together much larger and dynamic arrangements from um, at least in our experience, what we've done with normal uh, traditional published data sources. 
Uh, so if I was looking at one of these, I could see, I think our smaller ones have three, um, three different tables stored within them. And there's another one that's got upwards towards 19 or 20. Um, so it's just massive. And they have um, basically kind of um, borrowing the data warehouse uh, arrangement. They've got keys that you can um, use to pair them up. So you have um, the the user key, um, which is going to be kind of a unique identifiable one that in any case is always going to refer to the same um, user record, or there could be one for term code or something like that. Just a lot of, a lot of possibilities there. Uh, one other thing that I've noticed is um, though you can bring these virtual connections into a Tableau prep flow, when I've tried to use virtual connections and do some noodling uh, relationships within a uh, Tableau workbook, I haven't had any luck with that. So um, that was uh, just one experience I thought that uh, was probably worth sharing. But that about sums everything up. Um, after I got booted, I lost my chat window, so I have not been able to see if anybody has been posting anything um, while we've been talking about this. But if there are any questions, um, I, either I can check that and, and reach out to people separately, or I don't know if anybody wants to discuss that now if we've uh, overstayed our welcome. You have never, you will never overstay your welcome. Um, we do have a Tableau Prep Data Management um, channel in Slack. So maybe if folks have questions um, after the session, we can post in there. Uh, so thank you guys so much for giving us all of like a rundown of uh, everything that is available in the data management add-on, uh, or at least everything that you guys have used <laughs> in the data management add-on. Um, I think this was a really great way for us to sort of just get that intro of what's there, um, what's possible, um, and, you know, go from there. So. Yeah. Our pleasure. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Uh, we are going to go ahead and move on to the more musical aspect of today's session. Um, so if you guys don't know, Ginny, every single year, does a holiday Mad Lib. Um, last year, it was to Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. The year before, it was to Frosty the Snowman. I don't know that she has ever done Jingle Bell Rock, the Muppets version, but maybe in the future. Um, so <laughs> without further ado, I want to bring on Ginny to share what this year's Mad Libs uh, are all about and hear a little about what was that dynamic zone disability yeah a little bit of dzb all right so yeah I'll you know see. me <laughs> yeah oh, no 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 that's 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 a wrong that's a different song all right maybe just a little bit so um i thought i would pre-fill uh the parameters but then i thought we have time for people to put some options in the chat box and I'll just fill it from there. So I'm going to have you all um, put some suggestions for words in the chat box. We'll start at the top with term of endearment and uh, we'll just go from here. So whatever the first one in the chat box is, I will put. All right, sweetie. Next up, um, I'm going to go ahead and put Peter's suggestion down here because we also have two terms of endearment. I have like five different objects. So start putting some objects in here for me. Cat snow boots. Actually, I should put that in the plural object. All right. Oh, of course, a pickle. Did that pickle come from Lisa Trescott? It did. How did you guess? I am shocked. 
window. Oh. Come on, Sophie. <laughs> I'll put that under plural objects. Apparently people are really hungry right now. I feel like we're preventing people from having their lunch or dinner. Uh-oh. <laughs> All right. Um, since sweat is also a verb, I'm going to put that here. A holiday. We have a holiday. Festivus. A place. Oh, my <laughs> An adjective, we have a few of those. Fuzzy. Beauty. Green. And one final verb. Run. All right, I think we've got everything. Wait, wait, there's an adjective missing oh, right under the fire. Okay. Thank you. One more adjective. Good eye. Sleepy. All right. So um, because I didn't do it before we started with that, uh, you know how Mad Libs work. You fill in all 19 blanks. And then we're going to click on one of the gift boxes, to open it, and see what's inside. Finally, we'll be able to sing along to the tune with our new lyrics. You might notice there are two different gift boxes, and that's because there are two different song options. We'll, we'll look at both. So the first is uh, Sing It to the Tune of Last Christmas by Wham. And then if you don't know the tune, you can click play down here and watch the music video and kind of sing along with your new, um, with your new lyrics. And because we probably don't have time to sing along all together, I can um, export this image and share it in our Slack group. But... Let's see what the other song is first. Okay, Santa Baby, which um, one of my favorite Christmas songs. So um, I built out these two different song options using dynamic zone visibility. So I'm gonna go out into the actual workbook to show you how this is done. So I've already pre-filled this for everyone. And if we click on one of the gift boxes, and then select, like this is our last Christmas lyrics, you'll see that this is actually a vertical container. And we have clicked on our layout screen, control visibility using a value. And the value is our last Christmas parameter. So if we were to go to one of these sheets, we could take a closer look at that last Christmas parameter, which is actually song choice. We're going to go to edit. All right, so we have a parameter named song choice, and this is a string parameter. So it can either be last Christmas or Santa baby or other. And I put other in as a, an option to reset the parameter anytime you were not um, in an actual, like that. that's the screen that we're looking at when you are filling in your parameters so that it has a, a blank option, essentially. So we also have um, a song choice calculation. If I can remember where I put it. Nope, didn't call it that. Did you start it with a P? Uh, you know, because I feel like I saw that in the. Yes, uh, I did. There Thank you. I didn't name it that. I named it last Christmas. So if we look at this, um, it's simply a Boolean. And it's just looking to see is song choice equal to LC? And if it's Santa Baby, is song choice equal to SB? All right. So when we're here showing our dynamic zone visibility. We're using last Christmas um, to control these lyrics. And we are using Santa Baby to control these lyrics. 
So if I go up to dashboard actions, I can see that um, here's where we are using dashboard actions to change what the parameter is set to in order to control this dashboard visibility. So if we look closer, we have our last Christmas gift box affecting the target parameter song choice. So if we are looking at the max of LC, um, that would tell us to set our parameter to last Christmas. And then when I clear that parameter, it sets it back to other, as opposed to keeping the current value. And then this one, even though I didn't remember to name it, is the same thing for Santa Baby. So our Santa Baby gift, our Santa Baby parameter, and our clearing list selection will set it back to other. So prior to building this dashboard, I actually thought that the dynamic zone vis visibility only applied to containers. And then Roshi was helping me with some feedback for this dashboard, and she suggested that I add in these nifty little embedded YouTube videos. And that's when I realized that dynamic zone visibility also applies to objects on your dashboard, not just containers. So if I select this object, we have our YouTube object here. We're going to take a look at it. It's just a simple URL uh, that's embedded. And when you look up here, we are controlling visibility using the value. And this one is using Santa Baby, just like the rest of this container, but it's not part of the container. It's just floating out here on its own. And when I click on the last Christmas, and we also have that embedded YouTube, and that is also controlled by the dynamic zone visibility last Christmas. But again, just a floating little object out here in space. So what if I wanted to um, add another piece to this dashboard? Not that I need to, but just as an example so we can see how the zone visibility works. So let's just bring over an, a floating image. I'm just going to pick something from my Tableau repository. I have this whole selection of Christmas icons. So um, let's go ahead and select a Christmas tree. Did you pick the Christmas tree because of your hat? Your head Maybe. Nice choice. Maybe. It jingles. All right, so we have our little Christmas tree. And we have selected it. I'm going to go to the layout screen, and I'm going to check control visibility using value. I only want this Christmas tree to show up when last Christmas is also showing up. We'll save. We're going to control it using that last Christmas perimeter. So when I click on this box, which clears that parameter, the tree also disappears. And then I can put a different image to float out here to show up when Santa Baby is selected. Um, let's see, oh, Santa, perfect. So you'll notice that this is floating like right on top of where the Christmas tree is and if they were both showing up simultaneously, we would have to worry about float order and transparency. And because I'm gonna control them using the zone visibility, I don't have to worry about that at all. Because when it's gone, it's gone. And that is one thing that I really like about zone visibility. When I'm thinking about um, like, why is this a better option than say, sheet swapping, just using a parameter, when it's gone, it's gone. You don't have to worry about, oh, if you're stacking several sheets inside of a container and then you use a parameter to swap between them, there's always like a little bit of spacing that's not quite right and you can't show any titles. You have to have separate, you know, title pieces that you bring in and, and they're all sorts of complications when you're using sheet swapping. Another complication with that is um, your filters. So I have this dashboard where I um, have 
let's say 20 filters. It's obscene. It's, it's ridiculously out in left field. And uh, my boss decided, okay, let's, let's add a new piece to the dashboard. And I thought the easiest way to do this is going to be a sheet swap because um, the sort order had to be, uh, or not the sort order, but the way that the calculated field was calculating had to change because the aggregation was different from one to the next. So I thought I'll just use a sheet swapper. So I did that. And then I realized none of my filters were working on this new sheet because they only applied, or even though they applied to both, they were um, pre-filtered on the first sheet and then all of the options, because it was only showing relevant values, disappeared when you swapped to the second sheet. So those are two situations. The titles being able to uh, be used with the, with the dynamic zone visibility and the filters being able to use with the dynamic zone visibility. Two reasons why I think those uh, that is sometimes a better option than just parameter sheet swapping. Um, but I will say that other people have had issues with dynamic zone visibility, one of them being Lisa Trescott. So uh, Lisa, if you have an example of when it's not always a great thing to use, I would love to hear your story about that too. See if you're here. I think you are earlier with pickles. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> So I agree. I love dynamic zones. I think it's pretty much always a better option than sheet swapping. The only issue we've had at Miracosta is uh, some glitchiness with the functionality where it doesn't always work as expected on our dashboards, specifically because we embed our dashboards into a SharePoint portal. And that's when everything kind of just breaks. Like it works on server, it works on our desktop, and then we publish it in our SharePoint portal and things get weird. Like you click on, or you, you know, you swap your sheet and the sheet it just disappears or it doesn't actually swap sheets or data will be gone. If you use it with a parameter action, sometimes your source sheet will just disappear. Um, and it's like, it works 90% of the time, but then there's that 10% where it doesn't. So we can't, we haven't really been able to use it because, you know, we don't want users in that 10% coming to us and saying, your dashboard's broken. Why can't I see something specific? And then we're like, oh, just refresh it a couple of times and it should work. So, uh, you know, we've worked a little bit with Tableau support and uh, didn't really, we weren't really able to fix it. I think it's it's a known issue of, you know, embedding your, your workbooks in an external site um, that, Hopefully we'll get fixed uh, with newer upgrades. We are moving to the cloud soon, so that might also uh, fix things for us. But I don't know if others have encountered any kind of glitchiness, but that's what we've kind of been up against. Yeah, I think there was one other issue I ran into where um, maybe I added something later on to a container that was controlled by dynamic zone visibility or in some way tweaked the parameter just a smidge and it broke the whole thing and had to start all over. But better to have everything in place before you apply that sometimes. All right, well, that is our um, holiday Mad Libs for the year. And there is a link that you can go to and fill it out um, with your own words. And you can share it with me on Twitter. You can share it in our Slack group. and. Um, can't wait to see what you come up with. I will go ahead and export these images to share with our group so you can read all of your new lyrics. And with that, I'll turn it over to Andrew to introduce our Tableau Doctor session. That was great and lots of fun as we kick off the holidays. So uh, speaking of fun, we are doing something called Tableau Doctor here. So uh, the idea is we're hoping that some of you have come across some challenges as you've used Tableau and that you're curious for the wisdom of the crowd on how to solve them. Um, so we got we got one post earlier uh, from uh, Kelly Scott. Uh, asking about dealing with no data or n less than five. And Kelly, if you're if you're on the line, would you be willing to unmute and describe the problem in a little bit more detail? Sure, yes. Hi, everybody. Um, so I have this um, I don't know, it's survey, it's surveyed, um, it's a survey data tableau. 
And when you click on certain filters, there are no responses. So I want to be able to show, uh, you know, no responses or no one answered this question kind of thing when they filter on, on say, um, a certain race or gender or um, any of the other categories I have. Right here uh, is, is like for an example, I have this little data not available just hidden under there. This is very rough, obviously. And so if I pick this that has no answers, it shows up like that, sure. But I want it to not be seen here through the top visual. That makes sense? Yes, that does make sense. Uh, curious if anybody on the call has an insight into that. My my current guesswork is that there might be something interesting with dynamic zone visibility. We'd have to build up some calculations to make it work the way that um, that you'd want. And this this is just floating. This one's just floating and um, brought to the front. Okay. Um, yeah. So that no data. Oh, okay. So can you look at that? Can we? Can you show what that no or data not available sheet looks like again? It, it's not even a sheet. It's just a. It's just a text box right now. But I can make it a sheet. Oh, well, maybe it is a sheet. Let's see. Because I got a floating one right here. Yeah. Um, I was playing with a couple of things. Sorry. <laughs> and, and I know in the past, Allie something about transparency and making something, you know, no color as opposed to, yeah, <laughs> that's what at least it says, right. So um, where are, should I change that? If you go to that tree map sheet mm -hmm. uh, under colors, you should be able to, and then the color, yeah, uh, change your opacity to 100%. Oh no, cancel that and Sorry. see the little slider under it. Yep. Mm -hmm. Just toggle that up to a hundred and then okay. you shouldn't be able to see anything through it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yay. <laughs> One thing I might add, if you were really attached to the uh, colors that you had when they were slightly transparent, how the, it lightened them up, um, you might be able to use a color picker um, to to use that and get what the code is and just recode those colors in, okay. uh, change the spectrum a little bit. Yeah, that's super not, um, that that's great. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> that's great. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa, for live troubleshooting that one. Um, we'll promote you to organizing the California Community College Tug as part of the privilege. Thank you. Uh, anybody else out there in HE Tug land who's got a curiosity question about uh, Tableau for the group? Nobody else has a live question. I do have another example from our HE Tug Slap group. I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to steal it from you. <clears throat> I, I tried to go back and find this post and I wasn't having any luck. But there was a question about how can you build a line graph using a dimension? instead of a continuous um, measure, because as you notice, we have our list of terms, we have our list of enrollment for those terms, and the line graph is not highlighted in the show me chart, but there is a way around that. So I was going to share that technique. So I've got my term, I'm going to put that on columns, you'll notice it goes fall, spring, summer, and we all know that is not typically how we want to sort our terms. So the one really tedious part is that you have to go in here and manually sort your terms unless you have them in a, uh, like a term code, uh, like 2018, 40, 2019, 40. It's how we t uh, our code our falls, 2018, 10, 2019, 10 is how we code our springs, etc. So if you had a numeric coding system like that, you could use it instead, but in this case, we don't. So I'm going to go and highlight spring and summer 18, bring them to the top of the fall 18. I'm going to do the same for spring and summer 19, 20. 
I'm just holding down the control button to highlight both and then dragging them where I want them. All right, so once we have manually set our sort order, you have to remember in the future, if this changes, you're gonna have to go back and alter that sort order again. But for the time being, we've got our terms in order. We're gonna drag our enrollment onto rows. It automatically defaults to the bar chart. But if you notice over here under marks, just because it's automatically set to bar chart doesn't mean that's the only option. We can go in here and set it to line chart and then we could turn on our, our uh, numbers, our labels, and there is how you build a line chart using a uh, dimension as your field. Rebecca's right, you can uh, set that sort order as the default and it saves lots of time. It will default to that every time you put it on any sheet then. Um, if it's helpful to folks, I can walk through another technique of dealing with the N less than five challenge. Um, I interpreted the question that Kelly had quite differently from survey survey type data, but if anybody's curious, here's a, here's a quick one on how you can deal with that. Me, I want to see it. Okay. Okay, uh, hopefully you can see Tableau now, fingers crossed. Yep. All right, so this example is the idea of, uh, let's try and highlight uh, those parts of our chart or table in this case that are less than five. So I've done that for you uh, in advance. Um, at the top right, we've got a parameter that specifies what the threshold is in case we wanted to play around with it. Uh, we've got a calculated field on color that'll highlight it. And this was really for Zoom so that we could see it a little bit easier. Um, so the way that that calculation works is we take the sum of the registered and we check if it's less than or equal to that threshold parameter that we created. Uh, if it is, it's going to return true. If it's not, it's going to return false. And then I adjusted the colors so that true was orange and kind of popped off the page and false was gray. Um, okay, so with, with all that said, let's duplicate this sheet and... I made one other calculated field here. Uh, so I'm leveraging that previous one I showed you. So if basically if we're highlighting that particular row of our data, we then want to display null uh, or the absence of a value, otherwise display the sum of registered. And so what that'll do um, out of the box, if we put that onto label, is that for all of our standard rows that have enough people in them, uh, is going to display the number of registered. But if we go down towards the bottom here, this 231 course, for example, uh, there's two people in the 2019-10 term. And so that's one that we wouldn't want to show anything. And you may notice this is one of the few rows on this screen that only has uh, one of the number two rather than, rather than two of it. So let's go into uh, how we deal with that. So I'll duplicate the sheet again. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to adjust the custom formatting on my calculated field. Uh, so I'll hit the drop down for registered course. That was the calculation I just showed you. And I'll go to formatting. And in the left here under special values, I'm going to say n less than five or some other creative way of saying there's no data well keeping in mind the screen real estate issues. And I'll hit enter. And so now what I see um, under my 231 course is I have an n less than five label there. So I can remove the original registered because we're no longer testing if this works and everything just moved on me, sorry. Um, so now I can see that orange highlighted one is n less than five. And from here, I could remove my highlighting if I wanted to, um, but for illustrative purposes and time, I think it's probably fine. One thing I will mention though, as a bit of a gotcha is if you add totals to this, so if we go to the analytics pane and we add, let's go with row totals. So it doesn't move everything on me. Um, here, for example, with the 218 course row, we can see the grand total is 100. And the ones that are displaying that don't have an in less than five, um, we can do the math pretty easily to say 100 minus 71 minus 27 will get us how many people are enrolled in that course that we've masked. So there's some gotchas here that you want to work through in a little bit more detail. But if you're 
just looking to mask them as a starting point. And it's a good technique. Um, the, the the last thing. No, maybe not the last thing. I don't know. I, I lost the train of thought on that one. I will give a shout out. I'm pretty sure I learned this from one of the Fleur Ledge twins. Uh, so my thanks for them putting this tip out there. Uh, and if I can find the link, I'll add that to the chat. Uh, so with that, that's a quick tip on how to deal with N less than five, especially in a table type format. Thanks, everybody. That was a really nifty, uh, Andrew. I'm glad you shared that. With that, we are going to wrap up. Um, breakout rooms will open in just a second. Um, in the meantime, uh, we do hope that you will share what you thought uh, about today's meeting, because um, we do use this feedback to help plan future sessions, like including a Tableau doctor. Um, we do have a meeting scheduled for January 23rd, just a little bit over a month from now. Um, we're going to meet Francesca Gilkey from Anacunt College, who's going to talk a little bit about Tableau prep as we interview her. Um, sort of related to this Tableau doctor session, we're also going to have a Can I Tableau That uh, segment uh, and if you have questions where you're wondering, can I make this work in Tableau? Can I do this in Tableau? Um, post a question in the Higher Ed Tag Slack channel and link that channel in the links uh, right above. Um, and uh, we'll see, we'll pick some a question out of out of that bunch of questions. Hopefully that shows up there and, uh, and work through it. Um, and we're also gonna have a presentation. What is that presentation? We're not quite sure yet. Um, but we will have one. <laughs> um, and if you want to present at a future session or want to nominate a speaker, just let us know. Um, just use the URL to present at HE Tug. Um, and just a couple of quick shout outs or shout outs to Tableau things that are happening um, or that are scheduled. Uh, one, the Tableau conference now has official dates. It's in San Diego, April 29th through May 1st. And you can uh, register to save the date so you get notifications when more details become available. Um, and just know that there usually is a, uh, a, a higher education um, discount through the nonprofit um, by picking nonprofit sector when you register. Um, Salesforce, which I know not all of us are Salesforce schools, but Salesforce also has an education summit. Um, how much Tableau will be there? Nah. Uh, <laughs> but if you go, let us know. Let us know if it's worth promoting it in the future. Um, so with that, we just want to say Thank you so much for spending your year with us here at HE Tug. One more year in the books. Um, and we hope to see you back here next year. Um, so again, thanks to uh, to everyone, to Sam, Lauren, David, um, Kelly for the question, and Andrew and Jimmy for being the best hosts, co-hosts in the world. Um, and to all, to all of you for showing up, asking questions, putting your comments in the in the chat. Um, and just being part of a great higher ed Tableau user group. So thank you.